Well, good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? Some people have food. Some people are already finished. So uh, we're glad you're here. Welcome. My name is Paul Zarling. I'm the managing partner here at Client First, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our very first financial education event in 2024. For those that have been at these prior, you know we like to kick these off with a little bit of trivia before I get to the speakers. And so the trivia today is, when did the New York Stock Exchange convert from using fractions to decimals in share prices? When did the New York Stock Exchange convert from fractions to decimals? This is great stuff for your next cocktail party, folks. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. All right, any guesses? Go ahead. It said 1995. 1995. 1985. 1985 or 1875? 1975. 1975, okay. All right, it was uh, April 9th of 2001. Yes, April 9th of 2001. So that's something you've, you've got for your next cocktail party. All right, I'm going to introduce the speakers. So we're going to be talking about the markets in 2023 here, right in January of 24. So we're going to have two speakers. We're going to have David Zarley, who's a head of investment strategy and research for, for us, and a teammate of his and ours, Kevin Ferrari. So David's been navigating the markets for man, over, coming up on 20 years? Over 23. 23 years, goodness sakes. <laughs> Kevin's been on the team with us for eight years, so it's been great to see him grow with us. And uh, he's got also has a CMT designation as well. Father for David. Kevin's now a father. I don't know if you guys knew that, right? So he's got a young young son. Great name, right? Colt Ferrari. Are you kidding me? Right? That kid's gonna be a baseball or hockey player. It's a great name. So these guys, these guys are really great. They spend every day navigating all this, so you guys don't have to worry about it. You can see the theme here is a bodyguard for you guys, and they do a really good job with that. So I'm very pleased that they're on our team, and I'm very pleased that they're able to share a lot of their knowledge with you today. So I'm going to turn over to David and Kevin, and I'll come back for the uh, Q&A session, then I'll wrap it up later. But please, a round of applause for David and Kevin. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is always a joy to do, to be able, and I saw the prime rib, uh, and that is near and dear to my heart. Um, we smoke some of that from time to time, and it uh, looks like they did a fantastic job. So maybe a round of applause for that team. Thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciated. Thank you. I always like to start with another day in God's grace, right? Warmed up a little bit so we could drive here today. Didn't have to worry about any ice. Now maybe we need to rake our roofs and shovel some of the downspouts with some of the warm weather, but... I always have to start with the legalese, right? Uh, these presentations are for information educational purposes only. Some of you are our clients, some of you are not. Those who are clients, we know your personal situation. Uh, those who are not, we don't. But the information that we try to provide, uh, I think you'll agree that when we think about what we're doing at Client First, that we are trying to build something true holistic. Holistic is an overused word. In the industry, what does it actually mean? It's trying to tie all the financial pieces together. That's why we have this puzzle man up here when we think about everything that goes on in your financial life. Right? We have a tax season upon us. It's a huge aspect of what's going on financially. Uh, love it or hate it, it's a reality of life. Estate planning, Social Security, Medicare, insurance, these are all important pieces. Today we're going to be talking about how we manage money here and our insights into what we see going on in the marketplace. Our agenda for today, we're going to look at seasonality, always an important topic. We're going to look at trend following. So adaptive, the adaptive investment management system is a trend following process. And, what, and I want to cover what happens with performance off of market bottoms. It lags. And so I want to cover that. We're going to cover that today. We're going to look at the only thing in markets that's certain is uncertainty. And that's okay. Welcome to life. Financial news is not our friend. I would argue that all news is not our friend, but we'll keep it narrow today. Kevin's going to come up with me. Paul's going to ask us some questions. 
that would be a great time for you guys if you have questions for us to ask. Because as soon as this presentation is over, Kevin and I are going to kick it out of here and get back to the office because the end of day auction happens. The reason why almost 98% of our trades happen in the last half an hour of the day, because that's when the auction process happens between the big boys. And so we need to get back to the office for that on behalf of our clients in case we have any adjustments to our portfolios. I'll cover our risk management game plan, and then Paul will cover some housekeeping and final thoughts. But with that, I want to bring up Kevin. Paul already alluded to, uh, you know, a recent family man. He, he looks as fresh as a brand new suit. He is what I would describe. So there's a, we have some core values at Client First, and, and the very first one is we love our clients. And some may say that that sounds cheesy. It really isn't. So what, what does it mean to love your client? You prioritize your day by putting them first and the things that you're gonna take on. You're gonna exceed expectations and you're gonna do all of this with the client first in your mind. And Kevin is exemplary at that. He is someone that we call that leads us higher because other teammates look to him as a resource. So we are very thankful to have Kevin. You're gonna love hearing what he's got to talk about. So please round of applause for Kevin. Thank you. Oh, they're being pretty nice with the intros today. Um, yeah, oddly enough, uh, and I'm not even joking, this jacket and pants had the tags still on it 45 minutes ago. So it's about as new as you can get. But it's nice. Feel good. All right. So if you've been to these before and heard me talk, especially this time of year, we always like to cover seasonality. It doesn't mean necessarily weather, although the weather's... You know, especially this time of year, I mean, you might see a couple seasons in one day. Um, but really, kind of this time period, you know, kind of the end of the previous year, beginning of the next year, kind of that yearly transition, um, has kind of some important time periods that we like to focus on. Um, so I guess if you don't know really what market seasonality is, I mean, it's literally just, you know, maybe kind of some of these defined time periods or cycles uh, that kind of give you maybe a hint. Um of what might be in store for you kind of in future time. Um, so this time of year, there's always three that we like to focus on. Um, so the Santa Claus rally, first five days of January, and then what's called the January barometer, which is just the whole month of January. Um, interestingly enough, what they kind of call the January trifecta, if all three of these time periods are positive, um, we actually have seen historically 91% of the time, you know, positive annual performance um, for the market and really to a pretty good tune of 18% higher. So that's, that's pretty good. So we're going to look at kind of what 23 looked like and kind of what we have seen so far for 2024. So looking back at the trifecta last year, um, we actually saw positive periods for all three. You can kind of see what, you know, the S and P 500 closed at for the end of the year, pretty good, uh, performance there. Most of that was kind of made up towards the end of the year. Um, but I just kind of found this interesting, you know, the three time periods historically, I have those marked in orange, kind of on that table to the right. Um, when we saw all three time periods be positive, uh, but the S&P not um, finish the year positive, and actually one of those years it was flat. Um, so I would only really count two of those years. Um, kind of an interesting fact, which I wasn't really expecting, um, in yellow there, which might not show as well on your presentation, but 1987, um, so I don't know if you've ever heard of the Black Monday, 1987 oh, yeah. crash, yeah. Um, it actually had the trifecta that year, and with that crash, still performed positive 2%. So when you're at your Super Bowl party, you kind of pull that one out. All right, so 23 looked good. What about 24? So nothing goes good on a snowy January day like baseball, right? Um, you get three strikes in baseball. We got three uh, kind of periods we want to look at, so let's see how this goes. All right, better up. First one, Santa Claus rally. What that is, the last five days of December and the first two trading days of January. Um, this chart kind of goes back to 1950 with the S&P 500 and shows that time period historically. And you can see it really is quite consistently positive. It's actually pretty impressive. Um, earlier this week, I actually kind of went back a little further, I think to like 1928. Um, and as you go back that far, it actually still holds true. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, so this period now for this year was negative, all right? So we got strike one. We swung at one on the dirt. 
which anybody else other than Vlad Sr. would probably get yelled at, but he's a pretty good bad ball hitter, so I think it's okay. All right, so strike one, not too bad, right? That's why they give you three strikes. Um, and, you know, kind of looking back historically, too, just at this time period alone, um, when you see a negative Santa Claus, you know, time period, um, doesn't really bode well, really, for the beginning of the year in January. Um, January only closed positive 40% of the time. Um, but really, if you think about it in terms of kind of annual performance, still two-thirds of the time, the s and closed positive. Um, so really not too bad. I don't feel too bad about that yet. Right? I think we, we still got a chance. So now we're going to go into the first five days in January, which is pretty self-explanatory, right? First five trading days. When you look at this, um, when it's positive, there's actually an 84% you know, success rate of that indicating positive performance at the end of the year, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, when these first five days are negative, it's kind of a coin flip what you see. Um, you know, even the annual or average returns are essentially flat. Uh, so not really much of an indicator there. Um, but these here first five days, also negative, but close. We almost had a chance there, right? I mean, I don't think the bat and ball necessarily is so close there, but the return was close. Um, so now we're on two, which, believe me, I've been there plenty of times. Uh, usually doesn't go well for me, but we'll see how that looks for the market. Hopefully the market bats a lot better than I do. Last one, the January barometer, right? So the entire month of January. When you look at this kind of the same way as the first five days in January, when the entire month of January closes positive, um, you know, kind of your annual performance is positive 86% of the time, which is pretty good, right? Flip side of that, when it's negative, um, you know, 60% positive, probably close to 50-50, right? So not as good of an indicator there. Good news is, so far, and this is as of close yesterday, the S&P is up almost 2%, right? So we took that outside pitch, didn't strike out, we still got a fighting chance, right? Which is good. So really that kind of leaves us with, well, there's technically three scenarios, but we're only going to look at two, right? January can either close positive or negative. And if it closes flat, then they're just doing it to spite me, just because I didn't talk about it. So we're going to pretend that can't happen. So um, I'm trying to think what at this Stock Traders Almanac, at Jeffrey Hirsch, right? Jeffrey Hirsch, yep. Um, does a lot of seasonal work and kind of put this table together. Um, so really kind of you look back at kind of these two scenarios when you get, you know, maybe the January barometer, which is at the very top, here is positive, but your other two time periods were negative. Uh, I kind of found three periods there um, where that took place, and actually all three times, um, you know, the annual performance for the year was positive. Pretty good, right? Um, pretty small sample size, though, as well. Um, they're at least all three positive. Uh, I'm not going to feel too bad about that. Um, the flip side, um, you know, if you kind of miss all three areas here, you can kind of see they're not as uh, good of a picture. Um, so we'll see, right? Really, all seasonality is is probability, percentages, you know, nothing's ever set in stone with the market, right? Like Dave said before, the only thing certain about markets is uncertainty. You know, it doesn't have to follow, you know, what's happened necessarily perfectly in the past. Um, but it just kind of sets a table, right? Kind of lets you maybe focus in on certain areas or, you know, kind of sets the table for what we might be able to expect, you know, looking forward. So we'll have to see. Next year around this time, we'll find out how we finished, see if we struck out, grounded out, maybe hit one out of the park. You never know, right? A little cliffhanger gives you a reason to come back. That should be right in movies instead of doing this, right? All right. So that's seasonality for the beginning of year. Now Dave's going to kind of touch on what he mentioned before, trend following, how that works off market bottoms. Thank you, Kevin. So why seasonality? So if you think about it, we're all seasonal creatures. We all go to bed. We all wake up. Some of us eat a breakfast. Some of us don't. Some eat a lunch. We tend to go to and fro places at the same time. Maybe on Sundays it's the worship. On the week it's I've got somewhere to be for work. I do my groceries on the same day. The reason why seasonality is important is we we the market is made up of human beings. Like we can have discussions about algorithmic trading and algos, but what are the algos created by? Humans. Driven by fear and greed. It's why we look at seasonality. It makes sense that if we have a positive January, it bodes well for the year. It's probably very similar to if you score a touchdown on your first drive of the game, the percentage 
goes up of you winning that game. The same thing with markets. That's why we want to study these things. Then as far as trend following, this next section here, I want to talk about that the market doesn't sit there and care about January 1st and December 31st. So our process doesn't care about January 1st and December 31st. But the world of finance uses statements that cover January 1st and December 31st. And so this slide, this next few slides was actually created uh, on behalf of a client who reached out and said, hey, uh, so we, uh, for context, we run four models here, uh, ultra conservative, uh, which is basically owning T-bills through various instruments, moderate growth and ultra growth. And those are used by our planning team. Uh, they decide which models you go in based on what your needs are from, for a, from a time frame perspective. Some people have a longer time frame than others. What I'm going to cover here is the growth model. It's a good representation. About 50% of our clients are in it. And I just wanted to talk about an email I got from a client that said, hey, I noticed that my account is basically, basically flat. It's only up like a percent and a half, while the growth benchmark was up about 10%. What's the deal? So I want to cover what trend following is and how it impacts that process and why we call that being unapologetically lagging behind the market. And here's why. This is January 1st, 2023. Who of you here are familiar with the orange and blue rules that we talk about from time to time, either at these educations or in person? Right? If we've got orange below blue, risk has taken over. The potential for increases risk has taken over the market. Sellers potentially have control of the market, especially when we see a downward trending blue line. So based on our process and rules, we don't care about January 1st. We're not going to own based on January 1st. We're not a buy and hold shop. Um, there's plenty of other places that do buy and hold investing. Uh, you are welcome to invest there. That is fine. And here at Client First, the reason why we're different is we don't do that. On January 1st, we're holding high levels of cash in our models. When we think about that process, by June of 2023, so six months go by where orange crosses back above blue, we're above that 4180 number. And some of you should be rolling your eyes in the back of your head because we talked about 4180 for almost 18 months straight. This is from all the client updates we're one of the most transparent shops on the planet. We send something out every single month that gives our clients an idea of if this, then that. That's our process. If this happens, then we're going to do this. For example, we need to get above this blue line. Checkbox one. Step two, we need to get above where the sellers have shown up before, which was 4180. If we can accomplish that and stay above that level, we're going to be fully invested in each of our models low levels of cash, and we're going to participate in the potential uptrend. So if you think about that process, by very definition, off of market bottoms, which we don't know in real time, I mean, I wish I did. I wish I knew in January 1st of 2023 that that was a market bottom. I don't. I don't know these things. The only one that does is the good Lord Almighty, but I don't think he invests in the stock market. He invests in his people. So when we look at this, by June, growth is behind 10%. And we're okay with that because we don't know in January if this is going to roll back over. It could. It didn't. And we're okay with that, and that's good information. But it's important to highlight that off of market bottoms, by very nature, it's not going to be participating in that moment. I call that not trying to catch a falling knife. Right? If we don't know what the market's going to do in January of, of 2023, do you know how many conversations I would have with clients who said, hey, I thought you guys were holding cash when this scenario was unfolding, and now the market's 20% lower? We stick, stay disciplined to our process. We're 10% behind. We're okay with that because when we have uptrending markets, that tends to be when the system catches up. We like that we're in an uptrending market now. We're in an account-growing position for our clients. We like that. I like to highlight examples from the past. What we did here is we took the S&P 500, used the adaptive rules of orange and blue on when it was going to be involved and when it wasn't. The big chart here goes from 1965 to 1985. 
The blue line is how the adaptive process worked in relation to a buy and hold process. And you can see that over long periods of time, it outperforms. Now, I'm not allowed to say that that's what happens in the next 10 years, but I've been around markets for 23 years. I know enough that when we see uptrends, adaptive does very well. But look at what happens when it's in protection mode and then comes off of protection mode. This is 1968 to 1971. Market is in a downtrend. The process is holding high levels of cash. We get a bottom in May of 1970. Kevin, this is before your time. Just FYI. May of 1970, we get a bottom in the market. We don't know it's a bottom in the market, but if you think about our process, at the very bottom, holding high levels of cash, the market's going to start rising. What it looks like on a one-year basis is it looks like it's lagging. But we know that over longer periods of time, which is what why we manage for retirees, we're not day traders, we're not swing traders, we're here managing for longer periods of time in an attempt to reduce drawdown. So January 1st, 2023, we're not going to be invested, and that's okay. We're happy now that since June, we continue to see the market in an uptrend and have been able to have position our clients accordingly. Clients know that if they've been looking at their statements since the end of the year, their, their account, account continues to trend with the market, which is good. So what is adaptive? It's adaptive and tactical. It's based on price, so supply and demand. It is the only truth in markets. Everybody can have their opinion on whatever they want regarding the market. Does it matter? The market, I hate to offend you guys, the market doesn't care what you think. It uh, doesn't care what I think either. It's designed to per participate in long-term themes of strength, three, five, 10 years trends. What it's not, it doesn't make predictions. It's not a black box. January 1st, 2023, it doesn't know that that's a bottom. We're okay with that. A static. Strategic, uh, strategic indexing strategy, it's not that. We're not in indexing, we're not buy and hold. It's not what we do. It's not relying upon subject, subjective inputs. Uh, I have an opinion on who I'd like to win the presidential election, but it has zero impact on portfolio positioning. I have an opinion on some of the fundamental things going on economically, but in the end, the market's been right more than wrong when it comes to what's going on econ economically. An example of this, so if you think about the correction that takes place for most stocks starting in January of 2021 for the S&P and other broad indexes in January of 2022, they correct anywhere from 25 to 70%. Do you know that the Board of Economic, the Bo uh, Bureau of Economic Data just revised the GDP numbers for that period and they're, now they're negative? So they were positive when they were reporting it. So the market was right. The bureau was behind. So it's why we use price. Price is the thing that, it's a future discounting mechanism, right? The market is looking, institutions are looking 6, 12, 18 months in the future at the prospects of the economy, the United States, the dollar, trade. It's looking at all of these things, but it's not looking at today. It's looking 6, 12, 18 months in the future, and that's why the market was right we had, a re like everybody was predicting recession, never came, never came, never came. Turns out they're revising the GDP numbers down for the correction that took place in 2022. The market already priced it in. That's why we track the market. It's never going to know the exact top, our process, and it's never going to know the exact bottom. Impossible. Spanish for impossible. We're going to be fully invested at market tops, high level of cash at market bottoms. And we're okay with that. So that's a little bit about our process, our trend following process. We're about as transparent as a firm comes uh, as far as delivering this type of education. Um, if you're not a client with us and you want to hear more, you can obviously schedule some time with us. Uh, we love covering this information. Now, markets are consistently unique. That's an oxymoron, right? That's a paradox. How can you be consistently unique? Well, think about the reason why I put the picture of the globe up here is how many times does West Bend experience a 100-year storm? Well, by very de definition, every 100 years. 
But how many times does the globe experience somewhere a 100-year storm? Every year. That's markets. Markets are what are called fat tails. So somewhere in the world this year, there's going to be a 100-year event. And that happens every single year and sometimes multiple times a year. And that's the same thing with markets. They are uncertain. It's why we use price. It's why we're adaptive. It's we want to track this information. And it helps us be an emotional bodyguard for our clients to prevent them from pulling out uh, and making a poor decision at just the wrong time. Or maybe uh, making an emotional decision on something they want to purchase. The planning team is really good at helping, giving them permission on, yes, go buy that car. And sometimes it's, hey, maybe we should wait. And we use price in that same way. For example, the average return of the S&P 500 is somewhere between 8 and 9%. That's the least likely outcome in any given year. So the averages, the extremes of return define the average. Does that make sense? So the least likely scenario this year is that we have an 8 or 9% return in the S&P 500. You look at this, there's extremes in all sorts of different directions, and that's why we use price. Speaking of extremes, leading up into 2018, you've heard us talk about the importance of January 2018. That was what was called Volmageddon. It's when a bunch of volatility products went under. We've been paying the volatility price since then, and here's my argument for that. Leading up to that year, right, if you have an uptrending market, you're still experiencing 5% moves about three times a year, perfectly normal. Once a year, there's gonna be a 10% correction. That hasn't gone away. In 2024, we're likely to have that scenario. We could be in an uptrend, still have five, five to 10% volatility, pretty normal. It used to be 15%, minus 15% once in every 3.5 years, and a 20% correction once every 6.3 years. From 2028 through 2013, the reason why I say volatility changed, and it might be actually coming back in, and what I mean by that is coming back to a normal environment, normal in the sense of the globe is normal with weather events. There were three 20 plus corrections in five years. So we went from one every six years to three in five. That's extremely volatile, but also may provide an opportunity. It took us two years for the S&P 500, which is the best performing index on the planet. This is Superman. Took it two years to get back to even. Underneath the surface from 2021 through most, uh, most of 2023, you had some areas of the stock market down um, 30, 40, 50, 70, some areas 90%. This is the first time ever that we've been in a scenario where the S&P has reached a new all-time high, while small caps using the Russell 2000 is still minus, minus 20% from its all-time high. We've never had that before. Does it mean anything? That might be your question in your head. Not sure yet. But I know that there's a really well-defined level where the sellers keep showing up near 200 on IWM, that if we can get through that, that means buyers are in control, and that's a good thing. International stocks are still down minus 15%. Emerging markets still down 35%. That's, those are some extreme outliers. Markets are uncertain. And what does this uncertainty cause? It causes investors to move into money market exactly wrong time. So these are the 2023 year flows. Investors as a whole left equity ETFs. They bought fixed income and a ton of money market. So you have a pile of cash sitting over here. Keep that in mind as we talk about markets. There's a whole bunch of money sitting over here because people haven't participated in what's been happening since June of 2023. 23 was also extreme in the sense that when we look at the median stock return versus the S&P 500 itself, it was negative. So what does that exactly mean? The, the market was carried by a few stocks. And I want Kevin to come up. Kevin's going to walk us through what this means. Like, how do you have a scenario where the median stock in the S&P 500 is negative in relation to its own index? It's a very, it's a, it's a paradox. 
That doesn't make sense. But it does make sense when you look at how things are constructed. So I'll have Kevin come up, and he can talk about The Magnificent Seven. Not the movie, although it does sound cool, right? Um, so yeah, kind of like Dave alluded to, right? You know, this idea of, you know, The Magnificent Seven, which really is just kind of the seven best performing um, individual stocks companies in the S&P, you know, over the last couple quarters, kind of this time period we've been covering, which you can see them there, Apple, Microsoft, um, Google, NVIDIA, uh, Meta, a.k.a. Facebook's in the back, kind of with uh, Tesla there, too, as well. Um, so, you know, kind of your larger cap tech names, right? And, you know, really kind of the theme that we we're seeing kind of towards the end of the last year, and I'll even kind of touch on it still a little bit this year, is, you know, big keep getting bigger, which this is actually perfect timing with kind of the Hall of Fame, you know, announcements coming out, but I don't know where you necessarily land on that side of the fence, but Barry Bonds, it's, it's a good one to think about. Definitely does seem to get a little bit bigger there. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, kind of towards the end of 23, you know, what did we see? You know, on the right side of your screen there, that green line up top, that's the magnificent seven. Um, you know, over the year, almost a 100% return where you're seeing a scenario where, um, you know, kind of your equal weight representation of the S&P 500, um, which the S&P 500 that we usually talk about is market cap weighted, so your bigger companies have a bigger piece of the pie. Um, you know, that equal weight portion of the S&P 500 was only up, you know, 4.6%. It's quite a bit different than 100%, right? Um, you know, not only that, just even the S&P itself, the market cap weighted version was only up 19%. So really, you're, you know, seeing a situation like they had mentioned where, you know, these the very biggest of the big, the top end of this index, really were kind of the only thing carrying market performance last year. Um, this kind of graphic on the left, too, is really interesting. 71% um, of stocks underperformed the S&P 500 last year, which, I mean, is by far over the last 20 years, you know, kind of the highest reading that we've seen and, you know, not really what you would expect from a bull market, right? Um, I know we talk about a lot you know, on the podcast, market letters, these presentations, um, you know, small cap participation is kind of a big thing you look for in bull markets, you know, like Dave talked about. Um, I, know, I don't know how many of you were here in October. I actually wasn't either, so don't feel too bad. Um, but the value line geometric index is another thing we kind of talk about, which is just kind of a fancy name for an index that represents, you know, your average stock. I think it's some 1,700 stocks. Um, just kind of shows you the average performance of that. Really, I mean, that index has been moving sideways for, what, maybe like 18 months or so. Um, so really not a lot of participation, broad participation in the market. And really, we haven't seen that change yet. Um, so on the right-hand side here, this is year-to-date as of, I think, a few days ago. Um, really, you're seeing kind of the top echelon, the top 20 stocks of the S&P 500 carrying 110% of the return so far this year which is kind of hard to think about, right? How can you have more um, than 100% participation? Really, it's because if you look at the other, some 480-odd stocks, it's actually reducing um, the performance of the S&P 500. The average is negative for the rest of that basket. So the top 20 have to outperform the index to really you know, kind of get to that whole number. Um, not only that, I know we've kind of talked about it you know, quite a bit, but you know, kind of those seven largest companies that make Dificent 7, you know, their share, their piece of the pie within the S&P 500 has really grown, you know, almost 30%. Um, you know, that's kind of been a trend, I know, for the last few years, I feel like we keep talking about, you know, how kind of some of those top names just keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, so I guess really, as of now, until we really start to see, you know, small caps participate, your average stock participate, it really doesn't seem like, you know, kind of this dynamic is going to change. Um, but we'll have a plan either way. And this kind of leads into um, kind of more of, I guess, a broad topic, um, but really something we've also been seeing kind of last year and actually a little bit before that is kind of a change in this, you know, idea of risk parity, which really all that really is is you think about a balancing risk, right? You have kind of this, this tier totter here. Um, Probably the most common that people think about, kind of like your 60-40 portfolio, right? 60% stocks, 40% bonds. The general idea is, you know, when that 60% of your portfolio, the stocks are not performing well, um, 
you know, that 40% of bonds should really kind of help prop up your portfolio, even out the risk a little bit. Um, that's good, right? Good idea. Makes sense to me. Um, you know, I would say even historically for the most part, I guess that's been pretty much, you know, correct. Uh, problem is, you know, these relationships and, you know, what we use to look at relationships, which is correlation, you know, that's not constant over time. Um, I know we've talked about that, and I have specifically quite a bit. Um, you know, markets are always changing. These relationships are always changing. You know, the only thing that's certain is uncertainty, right? Same thing here. Um, so what we have here on the left side of the screen is what's called a correlation grid, and really we're just focused on that first column. So everything outlined in orange. So it's looking at, you know, kind of the similarity and movement of, you know, these three securities, which AGG is, you know, aggregate bonds within the U.S., kind of your average bond. TLT would be looking at, like, your long-term treasuries. And then LQD is kind of like your investment-grade corporate bonds. Um, we're kind of looking for how correlated those are to the S&P 500, which... You know, if you've ever cracked open a textbook or had to listen on a lecture about what you would expect between the correlation of stocks, bonds, you know, what do you notice about those numbers? They're all positive, right? Yeah, you wouldn't expect that. Because if you have to remember, you know, how correlations work back to a stats class, negative numbers, they move in some degree of, you know, kind of opposite directions, where if they're positive, they move together. Um, so if you think about, you know, kind of your modern portfolio theory and, kind of that idea of risk parity, right? When you're constructing a portfolio, um, that doesn't really bode well for kind of your overall risk tolerance for your portfolio, right? Now you have kind of that 60%, 40% now moving more so together, um, which doesn't really, if you're buying hold, you know, help you manage risk very well. Um, so this chart here is just kind of an example of what I was talking about there. So you can see price um, for aggregate bonds here the S&P 500 is this green line here. Um, and that very bottom pane, which is what we're really going to kind of focus on in this next slide, are kind of movements of that relationship over time, how correlated they are. Um, so obviously above kind of the midsection there, positive correlation move together, below negative. And you can kind of see how that matches up where periods and the price charts kind of start moving together. Um, you know, what we've seen kind of in recent history, you know, going back a couple of years um, and continuing till this day, are that these correlations are kind of starting to trend towards one, to where they're moving in the same direction, um, which if you go back further in history, really wasn't the case. Um, and kind of that, you know, idea of using stocks and bonds because of that risk parity, you know, that whole thought process there really um, is kind of, you know, under fire now. Um so, you know, that's why, you know, it's nice here, right? We're not buying hold. We're adaptive. We don't have to buy these. Um, you know, we don't have any necessarily set rules to follow in that aspect of, you know, specifically what we put in portfolios. Um, but, you know, if you don't go about, you know, managing money that way, um, you know, it can, can be tough. And really not only that for correlations, but, you know, Dave was talking about volatility. We're even seeing now more recently a time period where volatility of bonds is actually greater than equities, which I guess, I, don't, I mean, that's hard to even really think about, right? Um, you know, everyone always says bonds can't lose money. Probably one of the safest things out there. They're more volatile than equities right now, which is just kind of crazy to think about. Um, not only that, we talked about this before too, but even just the drawdowns in bonds surpass that of equities, um, which really has kind of been thought of as, you know, probably not even really being possible. Um, so that's the thing. These relationships are always changing over time. And not only that, but these downtrends aren't over yet. You know, we're still seeing a series of um, lower highs, lower lows, the exact definition of a downtrend. Um, so until we start seeing some of these you know, relationship dynamics change in these, you know, downtrends kind of end, you know, for your longer term bonds and things like that. Um, I don't expect us to participate in that anytime soon. So with that, uh, because it is everybody's favorite time of the year, everybody ready for the uh, commercials? There's usually some good ones. Um, it's a little bit of seasonality, right? The election year. We're going to be hearing about it for a while. Been hearing about it already. Um, makes it hard to watch TV. 
That's why you got to pay a little bit extra for your better streaming packages. I mean, it makes sense. Um, so with the presidential election, you know, with this being an election year, with that cycle, you know, what do we expect? What have we seen before? Um, you know, it tends to be weaker earlier in the year during these time periods of presidential elections, which if you think back to how I started, right, we had a negative Santa Claus rally. First five days were negative. Um, all of January so far, right, knock on wood is positive. It's still not over yet. Um, that kind of goes with what we would expect to see um, during a presidential year. Um, but interestingly enough, um, which this has been kind of a fun topic, I guess, to talk about in the office, what's interesting, and we're kind of looking into the future here a little bit, um, but if January kind of turns around and we have, you know, kind of a more um, drastic negative performance at the beginning of the year rather than being more so flat, it's actually kind of interesting how that, whoa, lasers way up. Um, more of that matches up to kind of what you would expect when you get to an election year where the field's open, right? No incumbent running for president. Um, which, you know, I guess that's really here nor there, right? Just an interesting thing to think about. Um, I know we brought it up many times, right? Dave just talked about it today. You know, the news doesn't move the market. The market essentially sets the news, right? And I mean, there's been times, you know, it still blows my mind working here, what, now eight years? Um, how that keeps being the case. Um, so just something interesting maybe to keep our eye on, right? We'll just kind of see how it plays out. But really the big point we want to make this time of the year, right? Everybody has their general political party of choice. Um, you know, we might think, you know, one is better than the other for the market, but, you know, that's not the case. Um, it's still about 50-50s you can get. Uh, no party has a monopoly on market performance, and we don't necessarily see that changing anytime soon. Um, you know, it might change, you know, what specifically performs well, things like that. That maybe isn't necessarily always true either. We have examples of that as well, but, you know, when you kind of boil it all down, um, it's pretty even. So with that, I will pass it back over to Dave, who will get to talk about his favorite people in the world of financial media. One of the things I love about Kevin is his facetiousness. Uh, I thought he did a great job. And, and the beauty of knowing that no party has a monopoly is that you get to vote your principles and your values. You don't have to worry about market. You don't have to worry about money. Vote your principles and your values. That's what matters. So that's what I'm excited for because I have an opinion. I'm not going to share it with you. It doesn't matter. But I'm going to vote that day. And believe you me, I'm going to be excited about it. And you should be too, it's America. Democratic Republic, we do it every four years. Lord willing, a peaceful transfer of power. Be awesome. Oh, I got a couple, I thought I might get a couple of chuckles, yeah. Uh, the reason why I put this slide up here is the, the adaptive mantra is basically have a plan, have a process. Don't have a prediction. Predictions are, they're fun, they're great. Um, People like to predict who was going to win certain playoff games, and it didn't happen, and that's life. So we, we use a process, and the reason why I put this up here, and you, you can take your time. This would be one of the slides I'd like you to put on your nightstand. You know, what, what does a pundit do versus what a professional does, right? Everybody on TV is there talking to you, and they have an ulterior motive. They have commercials. They have things they need to sell. It's fun to talk and pontificate all the, about these things, but in the end, we better have a plan. We better be professionals about this. Because after all, in January, in the last quarter of 2022 and in January of 2023, the profession, you know, the, the pundits were saying the Wall Street Journal were now expecting a recession, almost at, at the exact bottom. We had a recession playbook. Uh, I believe this was from Forbes. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't want to malign them if it wasn't them, but I think it was the re a re recession playbook at the start of 2023, and the market has moved the other way. And so we got to have a game plan. We have to have a process for this. We're not going to turn on CNBC and then make portfolio decisions. How are we going to do this? And so that's why I always like covering what's our process. If, so, if you guys were here um, in October, and I'm sorry you weren't, Kevin. It was an amazing presentation. Um, but if you were here... 
you would know that our game plan had a lot to do with this 4180 level, which is the top of this box, and the blue line, which is the 200-day moving average, that we had to get above them and stay above them. We were fully invested in our, in our models in June, enjoyed June, July, and August, had a normal correction. We talked about it back then. Remember we talked about cognitive bias, that that correction that took place in August and September and October might feel like the correction back here, but it might actually not actually be that. For one week, we were in protective mode based on our rules. We were back below 4180 below a 200-day moving average. Quickly, the next week, we were back in, and we've enjoyed the ride since. We're thankful for uptrends. This is as of yesterday where we're at. We are now at new all-time highs. We like new all-time highs. That means the buyers are in control. And we want to participate in that trend, and now we update our game plan, right? The market changes, we change, we adapt. 4180, very important. All right, sorry, 4,800, very important number on the S&P 500. That's the prior high. The reason why that's important is when there's more selling than buying, what happens? Price falls. That's what happened at the start of 2022. We want to stay above that level. We also want to stay above a 200-day, this uh, blue line. We want to stay above that. We can definitely pull back into that, into that average, and then move higher. That would be perfectly normal if you think about Kevin's example about seasonality and weakness of the first part of the year. We could have weakness that pulls back below 4,800 into a 200-day, and that would still be normal, setting up for a very strong second half of the year. But what I like is the formation that we've seen. Two years two years for many people feels like a long time. Uh, my kid wasn't even in college yet, my oldest, two years ago. We've just exceeded where we were two years ago, and this formation of trend looks a lot like this when we used to be, when we were growing accounts aggressively. We are now in that environment of growing accounts aggressively until or if we're back below 4,800 and below a 200-day moving average. Does it have to happen? It doesn't have to happen. If we correct back in, that's fine, as long as we're staying above the blue line and orange is staying above the blue line. Now, if I'm allowed to be picky, on this bull run, I would like to see the Russell 1000 equal weight. So think about the S&P 500, the next 500 stocks equally weighted, so that your major league and your minor leaguers performing well together. We would know that's happening if we're above 44 on something like EQAL. You can write that down. Above 200 on IWM. These would be extremely positive characteristics for the market. So that's our game plan. Above 4,800, very positive. Orange above blue, very positive, fully invested. Can we have confirmation of the bull run by these two indices? We have to wait and see. Sometimes it requires patience. But at this time, I'm going to have Paul come up. We have about 10 or 11 minutes, five minutes. What watch are you using? <laughs> we're going to have Kevin come with me, and we're going to uh, try to see if we can handle some questions. <laughs> All right, so while they're getting set, I'm actually going to move over here just so I don't get any squeaky from the speaker. I've got about seven questions prepared. However, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll take those as well. All right, so I'll kick us off just to kind of get you comfortable. And uh, you guys ready? Okay. So your presentation was great, covered a lot of ground. <clears throat> One thing that was absent was international stocks or commodities. Any particular reason why? Well, for sure, especially looking at that this morning, um, in the commodity space, there wasn't much to talk about. I think, you know, of your major commodities, I think there was really only two that were positive on the year, um, which is actually kind of crazy to think about. Um, you know, which is a beautiful thing. Focus on price. If, you know, commodities aren't participating, we don't even have to worry about it. We don't have to focus on it either. Um, you know, international, I mean, had a little bit of life last year. It was kind of more, you know, late spring, early summer. Um, kind of died off a little bit there towards the end of the year, but, you know, we'll see. I mean, at least Japan um, is looking pretty pretty good, been nice. Uh, the rest of the world, we'll see. It's a big buck. I have nothing more to say. That was great. <laughs> Mark this down, people. <laughs> 
All right. So interesting, going back a few slides, uh, Dave and Kevin both alluded to it, right? No political party's got a monopoly on stock market returns. Anything happening beneath the surface that's providing insights about the changes in power we see during our democratic process? Now I have something to say. <laughs> you care if I have this one? Oh. So we're going to have, so these are bonus slides that we threw in there to save on printing, so it's not in your packet. So this is a, a performance of some certain areas since inauguration of President Biden in 2021. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys some questions. Since his inauguration, coal stocks, positive or negative? Coal. Coal stocks, dirty, for, dirty coal. For President, for since President Biden. Since, since President Biden has been elected, coal stocks up or down? Incorrect. The best performing commodity up 450%. How about marijuana stocks? Up or down? Down. One of the worst performing areas. It's not even on here. It's down 80%. How about clean energy, up or down, since he's been elected? Down, one of the worst performers, down 55%. How about dirty, dirty nuclear energy, uranium, down or up? Now you're catching up. One of the best performers, uranium, up 150% since he came into office. Your traditional energy, Exxon Mobil, you name it, uh, Conoco, Phillips, Phillips 66, up 86% since he's been in office. Defense stocks, down or up? Up, up 30%. Solar power, up or down? Down, yes, down 61%. So what is the media feeding us? Junk. Yes, thank you, junk, that's right. And not junk bonds either. So this, these are the things that are happening underneath the surface. Yes, there will be someone elected in November. Yes, the market will likely be positive three to four years later. But what will be positive is the question, and it's just a matter of when the shoe drops. And again, the market is a future discounting mechanism. These things actually, the things that were negative were positive going into that, and vice versa. So the market was... We can watch for clues on what the market's thinking about who the next president will be, and I think some of these are fan fascinating on who the next president might be. All right, I've kicked it up with a couple questions. Any questions from any of the attendees? You can just raise your hand, otherwise I'll keep going. Seeing none, I'm gonna continue. All right. All right, so you guys provide a lot of information today and kept it high level without getting into sectors or industries. I know Dave just provided a, a bunch. Anything else, any clues, any analysis, looking at any other sectors or industry performance? Well, here's, here, it, Kevin already talked about, this is international stocks. You take one divided by the other. When it's a downtrend like this, it means one's underperforming. International stocks as a whole, kind of garbage. Uh, not every Not every area, this is commodities. Uh, when we look at staples, so think about it. Do we want to buy Clorox or do we want to buy Microsoft? Those are that relationship. Just looking at that gives us clues on: Do we, you know, Procter and Gamble? Is that risk on or is that risk off? Do we want to protect our money or do we want to put it to work in some high growth areas? Here we have staples versus S and P 500. Down means when we are taking on risk. The market is saying we're willing to pay up and we don't want to own staples. And you'll notice, right, what does what the relationship do during corrections? This is COVID, moves up. This is the beginning of 2022, the relationship moved up. We've been in a downtrend, we've broken into new lows. We want to own stocks other than staples, and that's important. Semiconductors, uh, you know, there were really smart technicians back in the day that used to look at the transportation average. So trucking, railroads, airlines, we still do that. But I would argue that we're now in an era of digital where the semiconductors, and I think it's a fun name because conductor is what you are of a train, like when you drive a train, so we're semiconductors. We're, so we're driving information, we're carrying information. And so semiconductors here versus S&P, these are the highest levels since the dot-com bust in 2000. You might think, oh, that's really negative, Dave, like why would you bring that up? 
Well, if it took us 20 some years to get here, chances are we're not at a bubble yet. We're just getting started. And that's a good thing. Semiconductors are leading. Here's NASDAQ versus S&P 500. If that's leading, if we have Japan, were you even born in 1989? No, 1994. <laughs> Man, so this is, this is Japan, 1989. Hasn't gone anywhere. Think about that. That's a long time, 30 some years. We'll call it that um, BK, before Kevin. <laughs> that is, so that is uh, a poster child for active investment management. The BK DK? Nice. The BK DK. That's good. So if that breaks above there, um, and interestingly about this, enough about this, anybody know enough about Japanese bonds versus U.S. bonds? The duration, the length that they issue? So the U.S. longest term treasury is how many years? 30. Yep, 30. You were right. Someone over here said it. Thank you. Do you know what Japan just a few years ago started issuing? 50. 50. 50-year bonds. There's an arbitrage there. I'm just saying, when we look at this, there's information here from a stock market perspective as well as how they manage their debt. I'm not saying I'm a fan of that we need to be issuing 50-year bonds, but the race is on. And I can tell you that there's one president that's been, or one presidential candidate who's been pushing for 50 year bonds. That's all I'll say. Yeah, 100 year was an option too. And I'm not, again, that's not an endorsement. I'm not saying we need to do that. But it's kind of like one country has already done it that is known for carrying debt. How does this look going forward? It's worth paying attention to. All right, I'm going to ask my last question. Let's just one from the attendees. All right, we got one right here. We talk about the presidential election. What about the House and Senate? Who has control of that? Does that affect the market? Um, it the the. Maybe just repeat the question, quick. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The 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 good question is when we look at the control of the House and Senate by party, how does that look like return wise? It, it's very similar. We look at the, the best performing markets are actually when we have a gridlock. So if you've got one area held by one party and the other held by another, that's the most ideal scenario. And it makes sense if you think about it, if they're not gonna change the game, you know, the rules of the game, it's a lot easier to participate in the game. So think about playing a board game. If you don't have someone jumping in and changing the rules, it's really fun to play. But if you've got, if you've got one party in control, it's why we love America, it's checks and balances. Like why, why do we have to get away from talking about checks and balances? But sorry, I'm, get, I'm getting excited up here. Um, return wise, uh, from a Senate and House, it's it's very similar to the presidential control, with the benefit being if there's gridlock. And I don't know what that looks like this year. All right, last question, then I'm going to wrap it up. So you guys do a great podcast, Weekly Trend. Last time we talked in October, um, you guys highlighted, hey, the market could be ready to, to break out, have a little bit of a party. Since then, the market, while we use the S&P 500, has moved about up 15%, and our clients were positioned for that move. What made you think that was going to happen? So this, this might provide a little insight into our process. I did. Nobody knows that. I didn't. I didn't know that was going to happen. And so our, our process is built on thesis. So you have a thesis: market moving higher. What would support that thesis? These certain things have to happen. Well, those things happened and the market moved higher. It confirmed, and Mr. Market could have shown up at this party. Like all, the table was set end of October. We had this massive flush, panic selling. The next week, panic buying, which is called a whaley breath thrust. It's also called a zwig breath thrust. We had both of those. They're very unique. They're high, uh, at highly accurate signals. They confirmed what was happening going into uh, the end of October being a bear killer, what's called a bear killer tends to be when new market like move higher. It doesn't always have to happen. So I didn't know that was going to happen. We didn't know that was going to happen. You just operate. If if this is true that the market's going to move higher, and it's the same place where we live right now, if it's true that the market's going to move higher, does it not need to stay above 4,800 on the S&P 500? I, I don't want to overcomplicate it. It's just simple. It's simple numbers. But in order to go higher, it can't go lower. So we just have, we have our new line in the sand now. Do I think market is higher later this year? Possibly, but only if it's above 4,800. That'd be my answer to that. 
All right, we're going to wrap it up. If you would click for me, we'll, uh, we'll do this. All right, so all of you have a feedback form on your table. It also has a QR code if you want to use your phone. Please provide those. Oh, we'll... oh yeah, go ahead. So, oh, yeah, that's right. Fill out your feedback form right now, but I always like leaving presentations with what you should be coming out of here with because there's a lot that we cover, and part of quality presenting is what – what should I, what did Dave and Kevin actually talk about? What should I take out of this? And it's this game plan. It's that we're in this new alignment of potentially further upside prices. It's that we have a plan rather than a bias, right? We're going to vote in November. It's going to be great, but it's not going to impact how we make decisions on the portfolio. As long as we're above 40, 4,800, we're going to participate. Same thing. Does the market, could the market be weak into March? Absolutely. Does that negate the market moving higher by the end of the year? No. We have to have a plan. Above 4,800, we'll participate. Below, we're going to reduce risk. Below the blue line, if orange is below blue, we're going to be holding high levels of cash. Because I'm not here to tell what the market to do. It could correct from here. Sorry, Paul. Thank you. That's what you should take away. That You should put that right next to the pundit and professional slide <laughs> on your nightstand. All right. How about a round of applause for these guys? Right, you got 4,800, going up around 44, go vote. And there's plenty of content that this team's going to be coming out with. So we love to hear from you. Speaking of content, we do create a lot of it. So we want to hear in how this was helpful for you. So please provide that insight. Also on that sheet is if you need help with something re related to your financial profile, we're, we're happy to help. Please let us know that. And you can turn it into the team that's back there. We have a host of teammates uh, ranging from Sarah to Dominique to Emily to Jessica to Cade, a whole whole crew back there. So please fill it out and turn that in. We are going to have Rob Melick. For those that are attendees here, Rob is our attorney alliance that we do for estate planning. And he did a presentation a little while ago where he talked about estate planning and friends. Well, he's going to have one of his friends with him to co-present on a very, very uh, unique and helpful topic, uh, this person is a certified senior advisor. So how does that work when it's time for mom or dad to get to their next place beyond their own home? And how does that all work? I've learned some things that I, I mean, my parents are in a great spot. I've learned some things that, oh, I even need to look out for this, even though they're there. So um, it's super, super helpful. I'm really excited that she's going to be joining Rob and talking about this. Those invitations will go out from us, but that's going to be in February, and I can't wait for you guys to have that that information in front of you. Hey, it's tax time, right? Who's favorite time of year? Raise your hands. Uh-huh. Yeah, a couple. So if you're stressed out about it, come find us. This is what we do. We're tax and wealth advisors. So organizers went out to our, our previous current clients, and uh, if you want to be a new one, just let us know. We'll get that organizer to you, and we're ready to rock and roll. So with that, you guys know we like to put the puzzle pieces together. If you need some help, find us. Schedule a no-fee initial consultation. Just give our office a call or email us, and we're ready to go. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. Drive home safely and enjoy your weekend, and we will see you throughout the year with these educational events. So thank you very much.